Thank you for joining us at Beyond Talk. Good evening. Hello, bonjour. Thank you for joining us at Beyond Walls, Beyond Borders at the 10th anniversary of Ryerson Social Justice Week. We made it to 10. Um, as people join us and find us in cyberspace and settle in, we'll direct you to some slides that we have here, slides that let you know where you can find more information about us, about the program for the week, how to stay in touch with us. You see it all there. Next, um, about issues, next slide, about issues that are very particular to the Ryerson campus. The next slide about issues that are happening across university campuses. The next slide about local issues and campaigns that are on our minds that need support, the 1492 Land Back Lane and the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project. And we'll put these slides up later on after the speakers have concluded their remarks for you to find out more and we're gonna encourage you to get involved. We wanna hear from you, so send us your feedback, uh, follow us on social media, and um, tweet at the hashtag Social Justice Week 2020. Tonight, we go beyond borders. We are straddling three different time zones to bring you our feature event, Beyond Pipelines and Prisons, Infrastructures of Abolition, with the venerable Winona LaDuke and Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. My name is Kike Roach, and I'm the Unifor Chair in Social Justice and Democracy here at Ryerson. I'm coming to you from Takaronto, Toronto, on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. As Indigenous peoples and peoples of African descent, we share a kind of reverence for our ancestors. We know that their courage and their labor their creations, their wisdom, their teachings, um, their resistance and determination made it possible for us to be here today. We are grateful for their struggles. I'm also thinking, and many of us are also thinking tonight about the Mi'kmaq fishers. Um, on our hearts and minds are the Wet'suwet'en land defenders and closer here, the peoples involved in the 1492 land back lane. Um, Six Nations land defenders who are mobilized to stop the Mackenzie Meadows housing development project near the town of Caledonia. These folks are being criminalized for their resistance to colonial encroachments on their, on their lands. I'm also thinking and our hearts and minds are also with our African ancestors ripped from their lands, cultures, languages who fought to end slavery and with the organizers who are on the streets today in the global movement for black lives, who are also being criminalized um, for defending our, our lives. Um, to bring you this event tonight, it took many hands. So I wanna say some thanks. Thanks to our presenting partners, the University of Toronto Department of Geography and Planning. A huge thanks to the wonderful professor, Deborah Cohen, who played such an instrumental role in helping us bring all of this together. I want to say thanks to our beloved Dr. Winnie Ng, who had the brilliant idea about 10 years ago to found Social Justice Week. Thanks to the Social Justice Week Planning Committee, to the Faculty of Arts, Dean Pamela Sigamon, to the Faculty of Community Services, Dean Lisa Barnoff. Thanks to our community partners at a different book list cultural center, support your local bookstores. And we also want to thank our ASL team, um, from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreters, Marcia, who you see right now, and Christopher, and our captioning team at CCS, um, Michelle, as well as our media services team, Brian, and all of our sponsors, and our communications team, Julia and Noshin. But I want to say a very special thank you to Salman Khan, whose excellent work um, we've relied on for years. And, and he has been with Social Justice Week since its inception in 2011, um, and is just an awesome person to work with. Um, over the past three years, Social Justice Week has had the pleasure of collaborating with the amazing Yellowhead Institute, which is a First Nations-led think tank committed to Indigenous self-determination. Um, we're pleased that the Yellowhead's research director, Dr. Shiri Pasternak, moderates this evening's dialogue. You can read her full bio on our website, 
but just know that Shiri Pasternak is the author of the award-winning book, Grounded Authority, The Algonquins of Barrier Lake Against the State. And she has done a ton of work um, on uh, the issues of indigenous rights and uh, natural resource extraction economies, as well as um, Crown First, Rate, First Nations relations. She uh, teaches in the indigenous uh, justice stream and she's published in the field of legal and historical geography settler colonial studies, political economy, and critical legal studies. Please take it away, Shiri. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Kike Roach for being such a wonderful host to us and for curating this incredible event tonight. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce cultural advisor, Pauline Shirt, who has been with the Yellowhead Institute for two years in a row, bringing into life the work that we do and launching it to the public. And whenever I think back on those nights, I remember the opening prayers that she gives that open our hearts and our minds to the work that we're about to do. So it's a privilege to introduce her to you tonight. She's Plains Cree Red Tail Hawk Clan from Saddle Lake Reserve in Alberta. And she is an incredible um, uh, resource, but presence in the Toronto landscape who has shaped so many people's lives and is such an important person to the Toronto Indigenous community. She's the founder of the Wandering Spirit School, the first First Nations school in the city, as well as dozens of other efforts um, that have really um, mentored and shaped and nurtured so many people in the community. So without further ado, I introduce to you Pauline Shirt. I um, want to say miigwech for, uh, for uh, that beautiful introduction, uh, Sherry, and, uh, and also the, uh, the invitation that I was given here to come and sit with you for, you know, with this beautiful, this, uh, you know, the, the social justice week. And uh, so in the spirit of that, I accepted some tobacco, some sema, so, and, you know, to come in here and uh, open up and ask the, those, uh, you know, those special, beautiful, uh, beautiful cultural advisors from, you know, from the spirit world to come and be with us in here. And also, I just want to say, I'm holding the head of my clan, Migaze, and she will listen. She will listen in the duration of this whole evening, you know, to each and every one of us. And then she, cause she is the messenger. And she, when we always, always, you know, uh, uh, you know, say that she will gather all our great thoughts, our great medicinal, medicinal talks, thoughts and everything to, into the spirit world. As the meeting, you know, you know, proceeds, she will listen to each and every one of you. And then I just want to say miigwech also to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the University of Ryerson. And, uh, and I want to, uh, you know, uh, thank, thank all the, uh, all the people that have invited me here. So I just want to say that this altar that I have in here, it's very special to me. I always have because I'm from Medawana Quay and uh, which is the water clan from the three fires, which I, I hold a fourth degree there. Uh, you know, we always have water within us because that's what we're all talking about. That's the justice within ourselves. So I just want to say, you know, she's here, you know, she's here listening to us, but also, we also are being thankful to our dear mother, the earth, and we always offer, offer some tobacco to her. And I want to, uh, uh, I just want to say too, also, this is the 10th moon in creation. We can never, never, never get away from that, you know, from a 13 moons and she is here, you know, so beautiful. You see her outside, she's so gorgeous. And she reminds us how to put that, you know, that beauty within ourselves and to walk, you know, with that beautiful steps of celebration because that's what we are doing in here. We're going to celebrate here and talk about the great things that have done and, you know, that the things that have been done in our way of life. And so I say be quenched to that. And uh, 
I'm also very emotional because, because uh, there are, you know, uh, Kiki and, uh, you know, uh, Winona. I want to say to them, you know, uh, just their, their, their names. I knew their father personally. I worked with them hand in hand for social justice for many, many, many years. And they gave that light and they gave that light within me to keep on going, always that encouragement. So I say miigwech for that, you know, for that, for that, uh, you know, for all of those things that have been uh, given to me. So aham, the way my gonna duck, and then keep going, this is the to say to them. Aham, they want to be the way and the way and the hair go, 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 we see him and pick it up again. Now the woman is saying, "I need that." He no more harm to be. He was me no more to kiss me. Now harm to be him, but he's stuck. Capin harm to be him, but harm to be say, "I need that." He was me no more. Woman to be harm to be no more to be. Harm to be how we now. How we need to take that away. How we need to take that. We see how we are harm to be him. Harm to be him. We see how we are harm to be him. Eko tahan ba? Ahamin tumaya ho. Taka pito te tu ta aham. Eko sema wa himi aya. Eko hin ni pi mi ni mi aya. Aham eko tahan ba? Kapi kana wa himi aya. Kapi kapi umuta ka kio kan pito ta ko ya. Aham eko hawi no muti ka pet. Aham eko tahan ma aham. Eko tahan mi na kukum no. Eko tahan mi na aham iha pet eko tahan. Eko ben ni pi umah aham ihi mi aya. Eko eko hawi sema wa aham. Eko tahan na hin hatu yu. Kuya kakio, kakio kia no humuta haham. Miaya wen kai kaya ya. Miaya wen kaya ik. Miaya wen kakio kita wasim suo. Miaya wen kakio humuta heski. Kakio nishla be kakio kakio isino uta haham ke uta kapito tet haham kakio. Biaya win kami ko ya ham. Eko tahan ba? Eko tahan ba? Covid o mga siga de. Eko tahan ba ham? Eko tak? Eko tahan ba ham? Eko taho ba him biak ham? Kapi wisi ko ya ham. Nalas ko ba? Eko hindi no ma ham. Nipagi sus no kumis ham. Eko tahmi na ham. Eko tah na ham. Eko tah eko tah hindi maya sema wa sema wa hindi maya. Aham, wici hindan, wici hindan, nukum nan, nukum misadan. Aham, eko ta, eko ta hanba. Ipi wici ko ya, aham, eko hindi pimi na, ihmi aya. Awi no muta, aham, eko ta ho muta, kaya. Aham, o muta, kapi, 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 bita kok, aham, ihmi aya. Aham, kikawi no, kikawi no, isagi ko ya mstahe. Kikawi no, aham, yun ang nas ko mak, yun ang guma, miyo pa maada sa uno, tse, aham, eko ta, kapi, kapi intuhtang, uya, aham, eko ta, huma se, ma, hihmi, ya, eko, ahmi na ni pi, uma, hihmi, ya, aham, eko ta, aham, kapi, kapi, kanawain ko, ya, aham, kah, kiyo, kah, kiyo, kimusum na umina, aham, aham, witsi hinan, witsi hinan, ko, yas, ko, yas, aham, kibana se, mina, nista nan, Eko hindi ka sabi na aham na nas ko maghumuta ka wipi tukte sa kugig ay sino ang adishnabe kwe ni so ni so ahay ko awa aham ihi ihi in paisagi ay ni stanan ahaw witsi hinan witsi hinan ka kio ka kio kami ay ay ni sta sta he ha witsi hinan na nas ko sta he kina nas ko aham nuktawinan ko yes umak so I say miigwech to each and every one of you who have listened, you know, and I say my uh, greetings to you in Ojibwe and Cree, and uh, because that's the, the blood that runs through me, that's where, you know, that's where, that's what, that's who I am, and I just want to say, you know, how happy I am to be with you in here, each and every one of you. So all of these great ones, all of these great teachers, 
will be listening to us, each and every one of us, and she will be here. Aham miigwech. Ay, hi, hi, hi. Pauline. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like my heart has swelled three sizes to listen to you. Thank you for opening us up in a good way. Thank you for connecting us mm -hmm. to the world, to the spirit world, to our ancestors, to our families, to the birds, to the sun, the moon, all the animals. Thank you for starting us off in a way that helps us feel connected to the important work that we're going to do and prepares us mentally and emotionally and spiritually for the thoughts that we're going to have and share with each other tonight. Miigwech. Hi, hi. It is my great um, honor and privilege now to introduce two more speakers into the circle. Winona LaDuke and Ruthie Gilmore Wilson. Wilson Gilmore, sorry. Um, two speakers from whom I've learned more about political economy than probably entire stadiums of Chicago boys and neoclassical economists, as well as learning from them about infrastructures of freedom and resistance that can carry us forward into a smarter, safer, more sustainable, and more compassionate organization of society. Before I introduce our speakers more formally, I just wanna place myself as all the other speakers have done as well and say that I'm speaking to you from the contested lands of Toronto, where there are long histories of movement, migration, treaty, and disputes between indigenous nations over thousands of years. Settlers have only been here for the last few hundred and but as I speak, as Kike mentioned, not a hundred kilometers away, the Ontario Provincial Police have launched a war against the Six Nations of the Credit River land defenders for defending their lands. So even as a first generation Canadian, sometimes we introduce ourselves as guests here, but sometimes we're also involuntary accessories to a violent occupying force. And of course, we must be willing accomplice, accomplices as well in the change to come and to change this relationship. Tonight, we're talking about infrastructures of abolition with Ruthie Gilmore Wilson and Winona LaDuke. And Ruthie has been such a clear and compassionate and analytical voice in the current moment of insurrection. I know hundreds of people have been newly introduced to her, but thousands more have been reading and learning from her important work for decades. She's the author of the groundbreaking work, Golden Gulag, an award-winning book about the prison system in California, but also the highly anticipated forthcoming book, Change Everything, Racial Capitalism and the Case for Abolition, which is out in February, 2020 with Haymarket. She's professor of earth and environmental sciences and director for the Center of Place, Culture and Politics at Cooney Graduate Center and co-founder of the California Prison Moratorium Project and Critical Resistance. Most of all, Ruthie's work has shown us how capitalism is organized materially through site-specific, historically conditioned processes of containment and specifically the role of race and prisons in this configuration. As the New Yorker magazine summarized, she single-handedly founded a field called cultural, carceral geography when she was at Berkeley which examines the complex interrelationships among landscape, natural resources, political economy, infrastructure, and the policing, jailing, and controlling of populations. She really gives us a method to understand the economies of what, it, what is called crime and to think about what crime is worth to who and how and how to disrupt that valuation. Winona LaDuke is the author of a half dozen books, including the forthcoming To Be a Water Protector, The Rise of the Windigo Slayers with Fernwood Press. And she's the executive director of Honor the Earth. Uh, she's a Harvard educated economist who spent her whole adult life critiquing what she calls the Windigo economy of settler colonialism that eats itself alive. Oh, wow. 
she's been a huge inspiration to me and how she raises as a counterpoint to the Windigo economy, thousands of years of indigenous knowledge and contemporary forms of indigenous adaptation and innovation. This vision draws reference to the complex reciprocal ecological systems of seasons, plants and animals to advance new structures of self-determination led by indigenous land reclamation and what she calls intentional reindustrialization. What makes these two people, two of the most important public intellectuals alive today is not only their brilliant minds at thinking through an analysis of settler state capitalism, but the way their analysis has been sharpened on either side of a critical edge on the one hand, organizing interventions against and confrontations with the state, while on the other, building the world they wanna live in simultaneously. And this experience shapes their ideas into a beautiful horizon of revolutionary change. It's an honor and a privilege to hear them share this experience with us tonight. This conversation was originally scheduled by Deborah Cowan for May 2020 as the keynote event in the Decolonizing Abolition Gathering, organized by myself and my comrades at the Toronto Abolition Convergence. And the metaphor for that convergence was the humble mushroom because of the reparative work of fungi on damaged root systems and the complex communication networks between trees that they carry. Our vision was and continues to be a hope for a future that can be built out of the most toxic environments that exist on earth. And that is our intention for tonight, to transmit life-saving information in order to survive, to thrive, to build back better in revolutionary new forms of self-determination. Without further ado, I want now to turn the floor over to Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. Thank you so much, Shiri. What the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities, including symbolic and material infrastructures on and through which we change everything. I want to thank Deb Cohen, Kika Lola Roach, Salman Khan, and especially Winona LaDuke for inviting me and welcoming me, welcoming me to this conversation and to Sister Pauline Church for welcoming us into the world as it should be by bringing the spirits to presence with us. We can see across the terrain of racial capitalism how carceral geographies organize or disorganize all kinds of communities involved in many kinds of struggles often all at once. Decolonization against environmental harms for the right to stay put and the right to move around, for adequate income, adequate food, for protections from calamity, for opportunities to flourish, for education, against illness, for care, against organized abandonment, and the organized violence of criminalization and colonialism and dispossession, including and especially the extraction of life's most precious non-renewable resource, which is time. Abolition geography is the antagonistic contradiction to carceral geography abolition geographies. We can see it. And as we look across places and through time at provisional abolition geographies, we find the dialectics of space and place at work in practical, immediate, and normative dimensions all at once. Abolition is present which means abolition is life in rehearsal, not recitation of rules, much less relentless lament 
Although the surface of contradiction dynamics in their dominant reading propose carceral displacement or spatial fix as necessary, natural, or inevitable. But abolition is presence. It is life in rehearsal. In order for the contradiction to ripen, the stage tells a story too. And we've already been talking tonight about the conditions, environmental, colonial, displaced conditions in which and through which we try to make abolition geographies in order to realize a simple thing, which is freedom is a place. Freedom is a place. So when I say the stage tells a story, obviously I invoke Bertolt Brecht's creative thought, which then compels us to consider everything, everything in order to change everything. So I would like to conclude my introductory remarks with a couple of uh, figures who have always um, impressed my imagination to expand and explode beyond its natural limitations. One is Amilcar Cabral. Cabral, as many of you know, was a leader of the PAIGC, which was the Independent African, uh, excuse me, African Party for the Independence of Cabo Verde and Guinea-Bissau. Cabral trained as an agronomist, just as Winona Leduc trained as an economist and I trained as a geographer. We all trained, I think, according to those who invited us to train so that we would join the professional managerial class, but we didn't do that. And what Cabral did as an agronomist was to walk the land. He walked the land of Portugal, the colonial state, that had his home under uh, imperial rule. He walked the land of Cabo Verde. He walked the land of Guinea-Bissau. And he learned not only how to think about making the soil most productive, and he learned not only how to think about combining the energy and imaginative capacities of people and land and water and resources to make Cabo Verde, to make Guinea-Bissau, to make Portugal flower. He also learned how people imagine themselves in the world so that the work of revolution could move forward. As he studied revolution, he looked very closely at the successes of revolutionary peoples in Vietnam and revolutionary peoples in Cuba. And he noticed that in those struggles, the guerrilla forces fighting an asymmetrical war used the mountains to their advantage. And Cabral said, well, Guinea-Bissau does not have any mountains. So the people will have to be the mountains. And that to me is the high ridge of abolition and its valleys, that the people are the mountains wherever they might be. The other person whose thinking and work and history always impresses my imagination to explode beyond its limits is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman who having freed herself, which is to say stolen herself, committed as it were a capital crime under the laws of Maryland by running away, went back and she went back again and again and again and again and again. She did that not for any reason other than to make a home. She tells, tells us her home, she realized, was back at the plantation because that's where all of her love and heart were. 
Therefore, she committed to making a home for her loved ones, including those she did not know yet. Freedom is a place. Thank you again for including me in this wonderful conversation. I look forward to dialoguing with Sister Winona Ladue. Well, no, I invite you to respond. Anin, Anin, Nindaway, Maganadok, hello, my relatives. Nice to be here with you tonight and also special greetings to Auntie Pauline Shirt. That is right. She knew my father and she knew me as a very young woman. Yeah. It's nice to be here with you, with, with you today in this time. I'm here on the White Earth Reservation in Northern Minnesota where I have Zoomed, I have Zoomed to visit. So, you know, I was thinking about this one, I had a lot of privilege in my life, but one of our great leaders, I remember his name was Frank Foolscrow. He was a chief of the Oglalas and he said to me, I heard him say, he didn't say to me, he said, the only thing sadder than an Indian who isn't free is an Indian who doesn't remember what it's like to be free. And I'm thinking about that when Ruth is talking, because I'm thinking about how it is that you recover your freedom, you know, in, in any means that that is, whether it is the structural pieces or it is the pieces of incarceration, because certainly, you know, Native people, Aboriginal people, First Nations people understand, you know, that reality of incarceration. So I, you know, I took kind of a different approach. I'm kind of a girl who works on infrastructure. You know, and so I was thinking about, uh, you know, first of all, that, you know, at this moment in time, what we are talking about in terms of the infrastructure, whether it is of prisons or of pipelines, is infrastructure about life or infrastructure about death. You know, and what we want to do is build infrastructure that is a tools for life, that supports life, whether it supports life for Mother Earth or whether it supports life for people. You know, and, and uh, we live in a, you know, North America and the United States has a D in infrastructure, Canada probably D too. You know, I always thought we had first world countries, but what we have is stuff that crumbles because they got real busy being all about expansion and nobody took care to make sure that their infrastructure still worked. You know, and so whether it is bridges or whether it is roads or whether it is pipelines, they are leaking. Or maybe it is just the water because Canada has more bottled water advisories than any other first world country I can imagine. That is of course in the First Nations territories. You know, what we've seen is a lot of destructive infrastructure. And I, and I wanna talk a little bit about that in the context of some art. Now give me a minute here, I'm gonna share my cool screen with you. And um, there we go. Can you see this screen okay? Is that a yes? I'm going to go with it. That is indeed a yes. Yes. And uh, yes. This, this is this is our uh, some art from our people, and everybody here knows this art. And this is some, um, you know, art about relatives. And then this is some art from our nations. And I don't know. I think Pauline's seen this art. Not enough. If y'all seen this art up in Canada, but this is this is traditionally called the winter count, where a, a keeping track of things that happened in your nation or in your people. And so, you know, the coming of the white people, the plagues, how much horses, you know, different events kept track of. But in the time of the militarization, the Indian wars and the imprisonment of our people, our people no longer had the grand buffalo robes upon which to, to paint. And so we were, we, in our imprisonment, we began to paint on paper and then something called ledger art where we recorded these historic events, you know, of our of uh, different times. This is, you know, war. I like this one because it looked like the Indians were winning. I felt good about that one. And then there's this one, which shows kind of the beginning of incarceration, the moving of people from the northern plains into uh, into prison camps, into prison camps, rounded up and then unloading. Here they are unloading. This art is from when they are unloading from the trains to the steamboat to take them to the Fort Marion prison, which is in, uh, which is in um, 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 Florida, you know, St. Augustine is where that is. But I just wanted to talk about that because this is recordings of some infrastructure, but then I want to talk about the art of today. And so 
ledger art usually records historic events. It records historic events. And so, you know, many years now I've been fighting pipelines from Canada. Seems like Canada can't get enough of pipelines, has no plan B, has no plan A either, just a plan to just kind of keep going. And so I commissioned this piece of art, which is called the Last Breath of the Black Snake, which is about the killing of the Keystone XL pipeline. And so you have the same art form, and now we are tackling the infrastructure of oppression that you see in this. You see, uh, you know, all these Indians shooting up that pipeline project and all these cowboys, the Cowboys and Indians Alliance is what is recorded in this. And, you know, usually ledger art a lot of times has men in it, but I made them put a woman in it. So there, there I am in my pretty green dress off killing the black snake. And then here's another piece of art which is art of resistance. And this is ledger art, different artists, but this is us building the infrastructure of resistance. You know, we kill the black snake in the last one and in this one, we put up the wind turbine. You know, and so what I wanna say is, is that to me, part of what our work is, is the imagining of freedom and the understanding of freedom, remembering it because I did not forget what it was like to be free. And then the creating of that you know, in our words, in our proposals, in our infrastructure and in our art. And so, you know, that is that is part of what I wanted to, to share is this process and then how you also, in our case, you just take over the infrastructure with art. You know, we have a lot of that in uh, in uh, Canada as well, but this is the housing project that I, that I live next to. And so to me, this is kind of like the question of the infrastructure of the people or the infrastructure of Canada or the colonial, the colonial nations. And, you know, we don't need a, a long talk about all the implications of the, of the stranded assets of energy infrastructure, the mega dam projects. What we need though is infrastructure that makes sense for people, you know, and, and makes sense for mother earth. And so, you know, just in the last couple of pictures, I got, you know, some examples of that. This is a rail line that we need to have we want to be the country, the North American continent that is not backwards with our rail system. We want an electric rail system. It's called solutionary rail. If you've got infrastructure, you should make it work. Backbones, backbones of North America. And we need to reclaim the rail line infrastructure so that it serves people, you know, and makes, makes some sense. And then, um, you know, we as well, in the work I do particularly, I work on the new green revolution. And my interest is really in the, uh, building of a hemp economy of infrastructure. You know, noting that hemp itself can uh, do about anything, not only that fossil fuels do, but that anything does. And, and uh, but that this, I call this the new green revolution, hemp. I say that freely because the green revolution started here in Minnesota, the University of Minnesota with Norman Borlaug. And so the new green revolution should also start here I uh, say that when you build a new infrastructure, you have a chance of doing it right. And, uh, you know, whether it's Canada, or the United States, what you want to do is make sure that infrastructure benefits people of color, not just, uh, you know, uh, colonial people. And, uh, you know, just to say that, um, you know, in this moment that we have a lot of our work in my community, we work with a lot of people to make this change. and. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be part of changing the infrastructure of this country. And I'm also proud to be part of challenging the infrastructure of Canada. And, um, you know, in the process of envisioning what we are making, we make sure that we make our, make our, make our infrastructure, put our, put our face on our infrastructure these days. So this woman, water protector, she's in downtown Duluth. She's beautiful. She's about 40 by 20. And, uh, She's the infrastructure of the future. So um, that's what I that's what I want to start talking about. And um, happy to uh, visit with Ruthie and uh, Shiri. I don't want to get in the way of a naturally developing conversation, but. Um, to get things started, maybe I want to reference an earlier conversation we had this week about 
wanting to get away from a parallelism between decolonization and abolition in terms of infrastructures and places of freedom. So I wonder if I could invite you to think together about how to bring those movements or think those movements together in ways that either hold hands now or you can see on the horizon moving together. Ruthie. Sure. Um, thank you. And thank you for sharing those um, amazing images, Winona. I love seeing them. Um, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, anybody who thinks abolition and decolonization are parallel or living in a parallel universe from the one that I think we actually inhabit because abolition requires decolonization. And, you know, it might be a question whether decolonization requires abolition, but abolition can't happen if colonization continues. So that's the first thing I want to say. And second, related to that, is that um, for a lot of people, for good reason, abolition seems to mean something that has to do with getting people, principally people of color, principally black people out of prison and jail, principally in the United States. Abolition might start with the focus on the deadliness of prison and jail, but in order to live in a world without prison and jails, everything has to change, everything. That means colonialism cannot continue. That means capitalism cannot continue. Therefore, abolition, rather than being a, a narrowly defined movement that is uh, for, by, and about a segment of the world's dispossessed, dispossessed people, what it actually is, is an opening of freedom movement to freedom movement within freedom movement. To give a particular example of this, um, I've been working for about a year now with a group of people who are based all around the world, who have been trying to sort of write out the global, which is to say internationalist character of abolition in order to find a way between small c communism and decolonization everywhere. So I don't see parallels at all. What do you think, Winona? I think I'm, um, I think I might need a different question. <laughs> 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 that might, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understood. So could we have a different question? That sounded like a good answer, Ruth. Ruthie, that sounded like a good answer to me. Well, no, I think this was your question when we talked earlier, which was a real critique against the idea that people think about or talk about abolition over here and decolonization here and sort of pair them together as two separate things. And we were talking about the fact that they're actually not existing parallel running alongside each other but constitutive in the sense that the world that is being rebuilt is one where infrastructures that are challenged are rebuilt in ways that recognize indigenous self-determination and leadership and also recognize the important role in undoing all of the legacies of racism, enslavement and colonization on these lands. But I can ask a more specific question here about infrastructure because um, you talked about you sort of move from those uh, infrastructures of containment that were necessary for dispossession towards infrastructures of freedom that give us a different um, economy, um, a more sustainable economy. And so both of you have really done extraordinary work for decades fighting for and against particular kinds of infrastructures. So to open up the question about infrastructure itself, what is it about infrastructure that offers us a conceptual lens 
in terms of materially grounded points of entry into political struggle, but also in terms of sort of thinking otherwise about a world we want to live in? You know, it's interesting because in the time that we are in now, I am, you know, I'm quarantined in a remote area. And the closest community to me is the Amish community. And, and so there's the Amish and the Anishinaabe are all hanging out in this, you know, remote area. And it makes you think a lot about infrastructure and technology and choice. You know, because not, you know, we've, we've grown to be people that assume this is what y'all need. And in fact, you don't need all that stuff. You don't need a lot of things. You know, we got way too much concrete. We'll go with that as a start. You know, I think it's the third, you know, it's, it's the single most used substance in the world, concrete. And everything we are talking about, basically, that we oppose is built of concrete, <laughs> right? You know, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to build that? Why will we build it that way? And these are questions that we don't ask in North America. The Amish ask them, though. It's really interesting having these conversations. Like, they, they are a lot like the Anishinaabe, and in, they're different. But in some ways, like, thinking about the, the implications of that choice of infrastructure. You know, so, so here I am having those thoughts in a very, like, a clear way on mapping the infrastructure of liberation for a region. Like, what do you need? Why do you need it? Do you need those roads? What kind of infrastructure do you need? So to me, it is, it is absolutely, you know, I mean, and the, the other thing about infrastructure that I really, I think is interesting. Well, you know, Ruthie, you and I work on things that a lot of people don't think about. That fair? fair. They're like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. That's like me too. They're like, what? The power substation? I was like, yeah, that's how you get your energy. And like, who gets to decide where it is? And does it pick up solar or does it not? Is it fueled by nuclear energy or a big dam project in Canada? Who gets to decide who gets to use the power? You know, those kind of questions are questions that should be asked, that should be asked. You know, because absent being asking those questions, business as usual goes on. You know, which is the same kind of things that you are asking and we are saying in the abolition movement. You know, why is it that, you know, one out of, what is it? One out of four prisoners in the world is in the United States or some like really incredible number, right? How does that, one out of nine, I think, isn't it? I don't know, very high. You know, but why is one out of four? I was right. Ah, that's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But the point, you know, the point is, it's like, you know, is that, you know, time to ask all them questions because it's not working, right? Exactly. And if, if I could just pick up here, one of the things that makes infrastructure centrally important and endlessly interesting and also full of contradiction is that any kind of infrastructure, whatever it is, whether it's concrete infrastructure or the infrastructure of mass communication that's enabling us to talk across all these time zones now, means is that it underlies what we can produce. In that sense, productivity. So I don't mean productivity in the capitalist sense, I mean productivity, what we can do. And so infrastructure speeds some things up and slows other things down. And I'll give an example that might be uh, meaningful for where you're at now, Winona. Let's take, you know, running water. So running water is a fantastic thing. It's an absolutely fantastic thing. I lived in a house with no water for 17 years. I know how fantastic it is not to carry the water to the house. I know it. And, um, but it's also true that when a, let us say a settlement, we can call it a village or, or a, a crossroads or a town stops having a central place where people go get the water because there's piped water and there are pumps and so forth, then that also means that a certain kind of social life goes away as well. And so a new kind of product, productivity of social life comes into being. 
It can be great, it can be terrible. I'm not saying I wish I could still car carry water. I'm saying that when you change one thing, everything changes. So to go to the question that you were posing, Winona, about, for example, concrete. If, oh, I wish I had the slide. I should have done slides. There are a bunch of slides that I could show, each of which looks like a tsunami wave. You know, a wave that comes and goes shh, all the way from the bottom to the top. So one is the growth of population on the planet over the last 200 years. And it's almost doubled since I was born. I was born in the middle of the last century. Uh, no, it's more than double since I was born in the middle of the last century. Another is the use of concrete in, since the 20th century. Um, another is the rise in mass incarceration in the United States. There are all of these things that have the exact same curve. And one of the questions that you know, I ask myself is, and I'd love to see your artists put this into the ledger art is, how do we take those images and what those images mean and turn them into something new, imagining different infrastructural possibilities? So I just re read a, a story that a friend of mine is working on now about um, some of the land occupations in South Africa, in Durban and in Cape Town. So as you know, people there have claimed land. They've been occupying land for many, many years. It's part of land back in South Africa and have slowly, slowly, slowly built entire communities in which people govern themselves. There are schools, there are some efforts to put in infrastructure in the form of water and electricity. And one of the difficulties, especially now because of COVID, is getting adequate food. And the fear of famine is really enormous around the planet right now. Where is some of the food for Durban and Cape Town coming from? It's coming from the MST farms in Brazil. Yes. So the MST is the biggest producer of organic rice. This is according to my friend, Maisa Mendonca, the biggest producer of organic rice in that part of Turtle Island. And there's so much that they are exporting the food at cost or less to Venezuela where people are hungry, to South Africa where people are hungry and so forth. But this also, means that a certain kind of infrastructure, communication, as well as shipping is necessary. So the very kind of infrastructure that is burying us under concrete and plastic is also possibly uh, something that if we could seize, we could use to do more of the kind of circulation of the means for well-being that the MST in collaboration, not charity, in collaboration with um, relatives in South Africa is making a reality. And are you, are you gonna, I mean, I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, these opportunities that are now, and I liked when you started out and you said that all of this is here. You know, I really like what Erin Dottie Roy, she's talking about the pandemic as a portal, you know, and, and it's just an amazing like moment where she says pandemics make, you know, in, in the history of the world, pandemics always change society. You know, this one is no different. You know, everything that we knew is absolutely transformed now. And I look at this moment and I'm like, what are you going to do? because all of that cool infrastructure for moving food around, like that shrimp that is raised in Scotland and deveined in China and brought to a Walmart near you, really makes no sense, right? And we know how fragile these big systems are predicated on so much fossil fuels and so much different kinds of slavery, whether it is environmental slavery or human slavery. You know, that's what it's all predicated on, you know, and so, in this moment, we see how fragile it is, and we see this moment and this opportunity, whether you know through land back, and through you know these communities that are just you know creating this new world, and that's what I see out there now is the transformation of infrastructure because that stuff don't work. Big is not better, you know. Size does matter, and sometimes you need to be little, 
And now is the time that we're going to figure that out. You know, is that sometimes we, we need to transform things. And so she says, you know, when you want to walk through that portal, you want to bring your dirty skies, you want to bring your prejudice, your avarice, your hatred, your data banks, you know, all of that. You want to bring that through the portal or you want to walk through clean. You want to walk through clean. And to me, this is this moment where, you know, the work that we have done for all these years, I see, I see seeds everywhere. I see seeds everywhere. I see so much growing in so many places. You know, the Zapatistas used to talk, or they still do talk about organizing in the places where neoliberalism is not. That's my community. You know, nothing ever trickled down here. And so people kind of like, you know, I think a lot of people in my community, they see this time here, they see this, this COVID. You know what they do? They hoard their wild rice. They make sure they got food. And they get, you know, and they get local and they create new infrastructure that makes sense for these times, you know, and that's what I'm seeing happening in this moment. And I, I am, you know, I, I think we take this moment and we take the social movements that are transforming the society. When you look out there, we can all see the same thing. There are crises, there are ecological crises of biblical proportions, right? Mm -hmm. There is a health mm -hmm. crisis we have never experienced. You know, I'm just a little bit younger than you, Ruthie, but I never saw anything like this time. Political crisis like I never saw in my whole life. Economic crisis that I never saw. Things are just totally shaken up. And I say, let's keep shaking her. You know, let's keep going. Because now is that time when that when these communities, whether they are in South Africa or, or uh, First Nation in Northern Canada, now's the time that we can we can make something different because the rest of it is all shaky. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. infrastructure is shaky. And in fact, the statues are falling. Whoever thought that was going to happen? I didn't think, I never in my million years would have thought all those statues would have fallen so quickly. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can jump in with another question here just sure. to keep this beautiful conversation going about the social and political life of infrastructure and how to not necessarily even need to dismantle or destroy it, but ways in which it can actually be repurposed to create different networks of social relationships and different distributions of power. Abolition and land back movements have really come to capture this moment because they demand justice and redistribution in completely different ways. And so I'm wondering, you know, what are the underpinning ideas about justice that we can ground this repurposing of infrastructure in? What sources do you look to for principles that could regenerate social relations and legal systems? And what are some of the models or, or inspirations that you look to for organizing these material relations of care and solidarity? That was a big question. <laughs> that was, huh? <laughs> All right, back to the title of my book, um, Change Everything. Um, as I look around the world, I see people doing remarkable things as Winona was just talking about. So for example, in the city of Chicago, since the pandemic hit, the uh, density of mutual aid networks throughout that city is phenomenal. I haven't been there, I haven't been anywhere. Like everybody, I've been sheltering in place. But I hear about it, I read about it, I see that people are figuring out uh, on a daily basis almost how to um, bring the most um, ad hoc in some cases and longstanding and other relationships into being so that they can sustain people through this un, well into the uncertain future that we face. And people there, and I learned about this from people like Kelly Hayes and others, have been using um, already existing capacities, you know, buildings and schools and so forth, as well as developing new capacities in order to circulate um, things and people make sure that people are, are housed or not hungry 
So that's one example. Then another example that certainly predates uh, pandemic organizing is what people have been trying to um, develop in Jackson, Mississippi. And Jackson, Mississippi and Jackson Rising, you know, come out of work um, that uh, initiate, initially uh, was organized in a not urban, but rather rural um, area of um, of the South. And people there are trying to develop uh, cooperatives for production, cooperatives for food, cooperatives for housing um, in one way or another. That is to say, to put a barrier between the things we need for life and the possibility for somebody to extract a profit in those relationships. So the fact of housing need not um, support profit, but it does. The need for food need not support profit, but it does, and so on. So I see people trying, again, to live small c communism, whatever you, it could be called many things in many places, and this is, these kinds of communities are flourishing around the world. In some places they're um, connected to big things, big structures, big cities, um, big populations, New York City, Chicago, and in other places they're in less densely um, settled parts of the world, but still where people live their full lives. A lot of folks these days uh, go on and on for good reason about the fact that one of the big transformations of human life within all of life on the planet is that most of us have become urban. But that means that half of us minus one are still not urban and that matters as well. So those are some of the, the indications and thoughts that I, I have for the abolition decolonial world that's coming into being little by little and then suddenly quickly. You know, I don't, I think that like we all thought we had an idea of, you know, there's all these models and this is how stuff's going to happen. That's not how it's going to happen. You know, we don't have any, we're really not in charge, it turns out. I don't know, you know, this is a news flash, you know, humans are definitely not in charge. You know, many times I think that native people said, don't pick a fight with mother nature, won't work out. Don't want to do that one. So, you know, here we are, you know, and I look out there and I say, you know, I look and see what kind of agency do we have, you know, in our communities, you know, you can look and see, you know, what disaster capitalism, you know, can do you know, when they go and just, you know, kind of take, try to take over Puerto Rico or whatever, you know, and build the same darn infrastructure they had before. Or you could say crisis is opportunity. Let's make, make sense of the, of the crisis and learn from it. Like, I don't want to tell those people, like I got relatives that, you know, in that area, Northern California, Oregon, all burned up. You know, it's like, why don't you rebuild that so it makes sense so that all those farm worker families aren't living in trailer parks and they're living in solar houses. You know, why don't you use all that cannabis money and the Emerald Triangle that's out there to make something right, you know? And, and you know, that's what I see is I see this. And on one hand, you know, we all know what's going to happen is some big guys are going to do some dumb stuff and make some stuff work. But there's a lot of people places that that's not going to happen too because they ain't going to get there because the chaos is too significant you know and so in my assessment now is really the time to build the infrastructure we want you know so i'm making a hard case for solar thermal panels that's what we build over here you know i did i showed talked a little about the hemp which is the new green revolution and once we figure that out we want to own it i think y'all got that idea i don't want to be the last people to the table we think the new economy should look like people like us you know, that's who should be in the new economy because the old one didn't work out. Time to move on. You know, that's 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 really my, my thinking on that. But we do this solar thermal 
We're putting solar on all kinds of houses, tribal houses in Northern Minnesota. We could put them up in Manitoba and in Ontario and you know, to the North too, no problem y'all. Just let us know. But who's doing that is a lot of people who got out of prison. You know, our work in our community, like my village, I think like one out of four, one out of three men is in prison or out of prison or in some kind of a quick rotation, shall we call it that? You know, I've never seen anything like it. Our demographics are just crazy demographics, right? And so what, ha what would happen if we could catch one of those guys or a bunch of those guys on their way out and have them make solar panels and install them? You know, that's what we're doing. That's what we want to do. We got Warrior Way. We're working with these groups up there because, you know, what I want is to see this opportunity of crisis as a just transition to make something beautiful and to transform the infrastructure of oppression into infrastructure that is of liberation and infrastructure that, that transforms the world, you know, and, and, and transforms the relationship because it's relationships between people, but it's relationship between humans and the rest of the world, you know? Because that's where it's messed up too. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about we're super anthropocentric. Oh my gosh, we're so anthropocentric. You know, but what we know is what you, you know, what we all know here is that, is that in fact, we're not the only ones here. We're not the only ones here. And, uh, you know, we, and, and it matters what happens to the little be those little beings too. You know what, what you were just saying, Winona, put me in mind of something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And it's, um, you know, wherever I, wherever I turn, in Los Angeles and in um, Southeast Asia and in Europe and in uh, throughout a good deal of, of the African continent in West Asia and Middle East, um, People are um, trying to figure out in as many ways as they can how to actually live in the world rather than to destroy it. And this figuring is something that brings people together the way we're together now. And the fact, the infrastructural fact of this possibility gives us so many clues to everything that have to change. For example, I'm talking to you through my laptop and my laptop has a battery and the battery has lithium in it. And the lithium comes from where? It comes from Bolivia. Um, and if I need to get a new cable, I need to get it shipped to me and it will come on a ship like the ship that carries the food to South Africa, but it will come here to where I am now. So this made me think a lot about the two Amazons. There's Amazon, the global corporation that's based in the United States that is producing the world's first trillionaire. Just think of that, a trillionaire, really? one person. And um, that Amazon has, is so spread around the world that if we think about its organization, which is to say how it's deorganizing the world, by combining people, places, and things into those brown boxes that then get delivered to people's doorsteps, then we kind of see everyone, as it were. The people where the resources are extracted to make this kind of electronic communication possible, which is necessary for Amazon to be able to sell the things it sells. Amazon doesn't make anything, it just sells things. Um, and then the people who are the essential workers, many of whom are people who've done time or otherwise been excluded from many aspects of everyday life, who then do the difficult, dirty and dangerous work of making, moving, growing and caring for things and people that then goes into the Amazon stream and so forth. So you get the picture that Amazon is one of the ways that the world is knit together. COVID is a way that the world is knit together. But I was thinking about the other Amazon, the lungs of the world, that part that's mostly now in the contemporary nation state of Brazil, but not wholly there, and how that is the center of biodiversity. I mean, there's biodiversity everywhere, but that is the kind of beating heart center and breathing lungs center of the planet for 
essential part of the planet. Maybe center is not a good word. And the Amazon then produces the actual cornucopia for the world, whether it's you know where chocolate came from or where biodiversity still lingers. But it's also a place that is so um, imperiled now because of the fires that are clearing the forest in order to you know, raise beef to put into the food system for McDonald's so that low wage, high stressed workers can get a cheap meal and get enough energy to go back to work. So we see everything connected and connected and connected. And I think that one of the, the beauties of this conversation is to invite people who are participating in Ryerson's Social Justice Week to think not only that decolonization and abolition are not parallel, but like this, but also to remember the whole world is like this, the entire world. And the fact that we can talk is the proof of that. You know, um... I wrote this essay earlier this year. I kind of lost track. Did you lose track of time over there? I totally <laughs> lost track of time. Oh my gosh. Oh no, a while back, I wrote an essay and I said it was called Amazon Should Save the Amazon. Basically, you got that much bucks, you should just go save the Amazon instead of pimping that name, you know? And then, you know, I also thought, you know, he could like, you know, send on Amazon Prime a bunch of stuff down to those people to help them in their struggle, you know? It's like, it's such a ridiculous, like, it's surreal. It's surreal. And then, you know, back when we was young, I could say that, Ruthie, the oil companies ruled. You know who rules now? Not the oil companies. They they aren't even in the top 10 of the S&P. Exxon is no more. Who's the top? Amazon, Google, Apple, you know, Zoom. They're probably getting right up there, you know? And so this whole new world of infrastructure, you know, is created. And I remember when I was a young woman and my father, you know, we were talking about my father's name was Sunbear, but he used to hang out with this Thomas Banyaka guy and he was a Hopi. He talked about the Hopi prophecy of the web in the sky, the web in the sky, that the time, the world would change when there was this web in the sky that significant, it was part of the, it signified the end of the world that we knew in, the, in, in a new world. You know, and I and when I was young, I thought that was like Star Wars. Remember that military thing of Star Wars? I was like, oh, that's what they're talking about. But no, what they were talking about was this internet, you know, because it is an entirely different world. It's so interesting to think about. You know, in some days, do you play this game? I don't know if you play this game, Ruthie, but I play this game. It's called, um, what do I keep after I decolonize? You know, and so I have these conversations like, I don't know. Red jello, I like red jello, but I got to dish that one. You know, ditch the red jello. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, let me think. The internet. I like the internet, but I don't like all the stuff. You know, like some stuff should just be like not not so, you know, but, you know, but and I don't like 5G, right? You know what I'm saying? It's just like making these choices and, and looking at this moment, you know, and saying what we want in our, in our decolonized post-colonial just transition, you know, through the portal world, what technology we want, what, what, you know, what infrastructure do we want? What, what, what will, will help life? You know, it's really about life and death. It's really mm -hmm. about life and death, you know, because there's the infrastructure of death, which, you know, real good at that one. And what you need is the infrastructure of life, you know, and that may not all be concrete. You know, a lot of that infrastructure may not be concrete and we need to like start deconstructing that maybe some hempcrete for the houses that'd be great but just kind of like deconstructing some of the infrastructure and, and building infrastructure that makes sense you know so that's what I you know I was just thinking about when you're when you're talking about it but well I'd like to read your Amazon essay please it's in, it's in the book that's coming out oh it takes oh. a long time to get a book out in the day and age huh I um, wonder if I could jump in and draw from some of the insights that you're sort of threading or braiding along. And one of them is really to think about, you know, you're talking about, I hear you saying that you're ready, that we are living in the world that we want to see 
by already planting those seeds and doing that work and being inspired by those who are already building these better worlds, building these different worlds. But I'm wondering for young organizers who are listening or even some older organizers like myself, we're constantly getting entangled in challenges to realize um, these materializations of infrastructure. And I wonder if you can think of some of these challenges and how you've overcome them or some of the movements that most inspire you and in the way that they have circumvented um, or repurposed infrastructure in really inspiring ways. You gonna talk about that, Ruthie? I thought I did. I did a little bit. Let me say, let me say some more. Um, one of the things I find really exciting in many of the places where I've done some work and where I know people who are working is how seriously and with great joy that especially young people are combining study with their activism. And I don't mean study like do your biology homework and then go and do your in the streets demonstration, although that's fine too. But I mean paying really close attention, giving like absolute attention to what is going on in the world in which they're working and then thinking really hard about what that tells them through study about what is possible in the political moment and beyond. They're taking really seriously that there is a whole, this thing I call the infrastructure of feeling that are the revolutionary traditions that accumulate in various places and times that are not exclusive for any this people or this people or this people, but that accumulate through the struggles of many peoples and that come together and make it possible for the work that people are doing to become even better. Um, so what form does this study take? All kinds, there are study groups, there are, you know, people take actual classes, people do social justice week. And also I met these young people um, some years ago, many of whom are immigrants in Europe, who uh, from West Africa, particularly Cabo Verde and Guinea-Bissau, who organized these things, I don't know what a better name to call them, these pop-up universities. And they would just last for three days or four days. And what they do is they'd be going along doing their work, doing work about housing, doing work about school, doing work against the police, whatever their work was doing. But they would get to a point where they go, wow, we know a lot. We think we're doing the right thing, but we actually think we want to learn more. So let's like slow down for three days, invite some people to come and talk with us, do some reading. Um, because not that many things from uh, sort of radical thought in uh, uh, among First Nations or Black radical tradition have been translated into Portuguese. These kids would do the translation so that their comrades could read the work and then they'd invite somebody in or some people in and talk and have a debate and then figure out what to do next. And I think these pop-ups are happening all over the place and they're fantastic. They are not an end in themselves, but they're part of the great means to an end. And, and I guess maybe I'd like to say um, as a corollary to what I just said, that I become very worried when people imagine that they're individual experience compresses all the knowledge they'll ever need, that that is a kind of uh, terrifying idealism to me. And being idealistic, like having hope for a better future, that's a good thing. But imagining that one's experience is enough as against consciousness developing through what you do and through in, in encounters uh, not only with other people but with the entire earth is what matters the most and so 
having humility means being willing to learn and being willing to learn means taking the, the gift of being able to think, the gift of the intellect as something as precious as it is, rather than thinking that it's something to be skeptical of and to push aside. Again, I'm not talking about becoming an academic, I'm saying use, using our ability to think. You know, um, I feel like these, I mean, I'm just to start from the times and where I'm at. I mean, you know, when I met Pauline, she was at the Wandering Spirit Survival School in Toronto back in the uh, early 80s. She came in in my reservation. I got in a lot of trouble because those Amesters came to town, but I don't care. All right. So, you know, what's interesting is, is uh, about 40 years later, I think I have a survival school again because all those kids got quarantined. And so you had to create new school institutions in order to accommodate the reality we're in. You know, so I basically have eight, I think I have eight most of the time, 14 year olds that live with me, you know, and, and that's because they needed a school. And so we all kind of like came together and we decided we're gonna make a school where we learn about hempcrete, we learn about solar energy, you know, we learn about feminism. We learn about social movements. You know, today I was looking at my statistic. They just got out of their math class. And my quest, my statistic was at the start of 2020, Native Americans made up 8.7% of the inmates in the state of Minnesota. That's despite the fact that they're 1% of the 1.4% of the population. So then I was like, applied math class you know, how much more likely are you to be a native person in prison? You know, those kind of, those kind of things, it's an opportunity. You know, I don't want to keep saying, you know, crisis is opportunity, but we have trans, we have to transform education systems. That's clear. You know, in, in this time, we don't have any choice because those kids are not going anywhere this year. We'll just go mm -hmm. with that. I don't think they're going back. So what do we do? You know, to me, when you have these moments, you know, you figure out how you're going to transform things to make sense for you, you know, make sense for us because, and, and the thing is, is that in this moment, I don't want to keep saying this, but they do not have control over the system at all. I mean, we could pretend that there is control over the school systems during a pandemic, but there is not, you know, there are a bunch of teachers stressed out trying to figure out how to impart knowledge through the internet to a bunch of kids who are now in all kind of crazy situations at home, right? So what if you took that opportunity and figured out how to do something better with it, right? Mm -hmm. And in these other opportunities, you know, that's that's what I see, you know, as I, I see this, this moment and, you know, I learned a lot, I've, I've had a lot of privilege in my life of fossil fuels. I've flown around probably as much as you, Ruthie. I flew everywhere. Oh my gosh, I went a lot of interesting places. My village now, you know, there's people in my village that have never been very far, you know? And I, I start sentences with, you know, I used to fly. Then they all smile. But when I flew, I saw cool people that transformed infrastructure. You know, I got to see the Zapatistas in the middle of the jungle down there, transforming their infrastructure to make water and sewer for their people build their own school systems, right? I saw them transforming infrastructure. You know, I seen, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of different places, how you, how you go from what they gave you to what you need. And that's this time, you know? And, um, and, I, and, and I'm looking where you are too, where do we want? Cause it's not just like how we stumble through, but it's what do we want? What do we want? And for me, I think a lot about restorative justice because all your writing is spot on. You know, we should be done with punitive justice systems and certainly my community from those little statistics there, I don't think that's working, right? Oh, look, the color changes on my face when I put that white up there. My gosh, who knew that? But, um, you know, what, what, what we need is to make peace. <laughs> and that's peace, you know, you need restorative justice. You know, what you need is instead of punishing the person in our community, like they have a lot of history of restorative justice. How like the case of spotted, uh, spotted eagle, 
you know, kill his kill. It was on Pine Ridge Reservation, and and the and the tribal justice system said, when you kill that person, you got to feed that family, right? You know, I mean, that's restorative justice. How do you make peace? How do you make it well in the communities? And so, you know, for me, whether it is in the in the you know dysfunctional prison system or whether it is in the education institutions or whether it is in the infrastructure of energy, it's, it's how do we make something that, that works and makes peace, you know, makes peace. We're in the last five minutes here. I think that's a beautiful summation to cap off some of the um, incredible insights that you've shared, Winona. Ruthie, would you like to pick up there and make some closing remarks? Yeah, sure. Um, once again, I want to thank everybody who made it possible for us to gather tonight. I want to thank our remarkable um, sign comrades, as well as our captioning comrade for making certain that what we're talking about is accessible to as many people as possible. And making peace is certainly at the heart of abolition. And it will be a, such a fight and it is such a struggle that it's hard to imagine that fact, but it is a fact. And that is that we have to make peace. Um, there's a fantastic book that people who are involved in social justice week might want to get their hands on called Fumbling Toward Repair that my comrade and sister Mariam Kaba helped bring into the world that gives people a chance to think about the work that has to be done to realize restorative, or maybe we can call it transformative justice. So it's a, it's a workbook and you can sit and think about it. There isn't a magic answer, it's all work. Transforming the infrastructure is work. Doing what we're doing here together is work. And I'm very happy that I could be here to work and make community with you tonight. Thank you. Ruthie, happy to meet you in this way. You know, as far away as we are, we, we, we share similar paths, you know, sh similar paths. And, uh, you know, I think both of us seen a lot of stuff out there, a lot of heartache, right? A lot of heartbreak, you know, but also we see not only the resilience of people, you know, but also we see something more beautiful, you know, and, and to me, you know, I mean, I, we had a lot of privilege in our life. I can't, Matt, you know, I'm just really grateful to tonight and I'm very grateful for all the things that I've seen and the inspirations, you know, of, of you know, sisters like Angela Davis talking about abolition long time ago, you know, and I, I heard her, her say this, you know, and, and, and then now, you know, uh, as we pass this on, we say, you know, take those infrastructures and change them. Take those infrastructures and change them. And now is uh, now is your time. You know, now is now is your time. And uh, you know, maybe it be, you know, in your community, but everything is shifting. It is all shifting. And so just keep pushing. That's what I say. Keep pushing and make something beautiful, you know, because we deserve it. The world deserves be beautiful, you know? What perfect words to leave off on. I believe that uh, Kike Roach, who organized this event with Deb Cowan, wanted to share a slide so that people could find ways to support local land back movements, if I'm correct. Um, so here you can see two great projects to support, the Toronto Prisoners Rights Project that has a GoFundMe. It started as an emergency support fund for people being released from incarceration due to COVID, but has expanded to help hundreds of people and their families um, in, behind bars and also being released. And also 1492 Land Back Lane, which is a now, um, a permanent blockade um, in contestation of an injunction that has been made permanent in the courts 
against the land defenders um, who are refusing to accept that um, the authority of the courts to remove them from their land. So if you can, they really need that support as well. The link is there. Um, please give what you can to support these local movements for abolition and decolonization. Thank you so much again to Ruthie Gilmore and to Winona LaDuke for their incredible and moving and inspiring conversation tonight that gave us so much, um, so much hope to move forward towards a horizon of real revolutionary change. Um, and thank you to Kike Roach and Deb Cowan again and to all of the support staff in the ASL and closed captioning. Here you can see, oh, the slide just before is a slide promoting Ronona's new book. I believe there's a code there. Maybe we'll put it somewhere where people can find it um, so you can order it. And um, here we're seeing, oh, a lot of slides moving quickly. Um, there's a defund the police. Um, there's a campaign. So here is the Fernwood Publishing link. There's a discount code here, Winona20, till November 15th, if you want to order Winona's new book with Fernwood Publishing. And I believe there was another slide um, supporting a local campus initiative that's next, um, one after this one, I think. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm not controlling the slides, but I'm, yes, this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, there's a local campaign to call on President Lakshmi, uh, Lakshmi uh, to remove the colonial statue of Egerton Ryerson from campus. I totally support this. Here's how you can help. Um, step one, head over to the website. Um, you can see it here, Caesar's website to read through the letter. You can add your information and support and then share the petition with friends, families and networks to continue the campaign. So hope you can um, look that up and support it. It's a long time coming and really an important uh, move to get that uh, statue of a man who helped design the Indian residential school system um, get that statue removed from our campus. So thank you to the people leading that campaign as well. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to host. Thank you.